Hey there, it's me again, Michelle, and welcome back to the Canadian History a Chronology Channel. Today's episode, number 35, is about the rebellions of 1837. This is part two of this mini-series. Now, before starting, let's take a quick moment to review what we saw in the last episode. And as a reminder, that episode was about the Pemmican Wars and the lead-up to the rebellions of 1837. We saw that Thomas Selkirk built the Red River Settlement in 1811 in what is present-day Winnipeg, and that a new nationality, the Métis, were forming in the northwest of Canada and that the Pemmican Wars started in 1816. Fighting between the Hudson's Bay Company and the Northwest Company finally led to a ceasefire, then their merger in 1821 into the Hudson's Bay Company. We also saw that tensions over colonial administration were building in Lower and Upper Canada, setting the stage for the rebellions of 1837. And we learned that Papineau would lead a rebellion in Lower Canada, and that Mackenzie would lead a rebellion in Upper Canada. Okay, the summary's out of the way, so let's continue with the rebellions of 1837 by starting off with Papineau in Lower Canada. For starters, the seigneurial system had failed to protect the French-Canadian elite, and by 1830, more than half of the seigneurial estates were now owned by English-speaking lords. These English-speaking lords had purchased and traded their way into positions of power, and now these new lords, along with some wealthy merchant families of Montreal, like the Molsons and the McGills, dominated the ruling Chateau clique. Opposing the Chateau clique were the young, professional French-Canadian elite who had gained control of the elected assembly under a new radical party, the Parti Patriote. But sadly, they were barred from any power on the basis of their religion and language. So in 1834, the Parti Patriote denounced the government's appointed council and drew up a list of grievances. They called this list the 92 Resolutions. Among the many demands were two important ones. One, that the elected assembly should have control over public revenues, and two, that the government should be responsible to the voters so the governor should choose his council from the elected members. The leader of the Parti Patriot and the key architect of the 92 resolutions was Louis-Joseph Papineau. At this time, Lower Canada's economy was suffering. Crops had failed and immigrants were flooding in. Then a cholera outbreak swept through, swept through the cities, rumors of this being intentional and pointed at the English. A militant youth wing of French Canadians, calling themselves Fils de la Liberté, Sons of Liberty, began brawling with an equally militant group of English-speaking youths called the Doric Club. Finally, three years later, the British decided to address the 92 resolutions. To them all, the British said no. To the French Canadians, the response could only be war. Papineau, a great orator, whipped the crowds into a frenzy. And even some prominent English Canadians, like Dr. Wilfred Nelson, a veteran of the War of 1812, joined the Patriots. Nelson called for a revolutionary assembly to be held in Saint Denis in the Richelieu Valley, a hotbed of anti-government dissent. There, the mob wanted open rebellion, and Nelson stood and yelled, The time has come to melt our spoons into bullets. The governor sent British troops and Canadian volunteers to arrest the Patriot leaders and disperse the mob. Led by Dr. Nelson, the Patriots blocked the street and awaited the troops. Pepineau was not there. He fled early and escaped into the United States. On November 23, 1837, the British walked into a crossfire, and with six soldiers killed, were forced to flee. The first victory for the Patriots, but also their last. Two days later, a second British force attacked nearby St. Charles, killing 60 Patriots and arresting dozens more. The rebellion had come too soon. The Patriots were ill-prepared and poorly coordinated, and now they were on the run. Now that the rebels had been subdued in the Richelieu Valley, the government turned towards Montreal, where the Patriots had invaded the Mohawk community at Oka, stealing weapons and supplies. In mid-December 1837, 1,400 troops marched north to the town of St. Eustache, where they fought the Patriots back into the village church and then set it on fire. 
As Patriots ran out of the burning church, they were shot down by the troops. Almost 100 died, including their leader, a young doctor named Jean-Olivier Chenier. Now as the rebellion, rebellion collapsed, Dr. Robert Nelson, Wilfred's brother, rode south to find Pepineau. He found Pepineau, but Pepineau refused to join the fight. Nelson would say, Pepineau has abandoned us. He is a man fit only for words, but not for action. Then in early 1838, from his American base, Nelson gathered 300 Patriots, crossed back into Canada, and read a proclamation declaring a new republic with himself as president. When he returned back across the border to the USA, he was arrested in jail for having raided the militia base and stealing weapons. He was soon released and led another raid into Canadian territory. By now, in the United States, the Petriots were being backed from Vermont and New York by a secret society called the Hunter's Lodge, Société des Frères Chassards. They wanted to topple the government in Canada and establish a second republic on the continent. But this too failed. In six battles over two years, 27 soldiers and nearly 300 French Canadians died. Leading the campaign against the Patriots was John Colborn. He was a former Lieutenant Governor of Upper Canada, but had been pushed out of office by English reformers. He had no love for the French, as he had fought against Napoleon at Waterloo. Now he wanted revenge. Colborn and his men burned hundreds of Habitat's homes, arrested thousands of people, hanged a dozen, and sent almost 60 to the penal colonies in Australia. Well, on that note, let's end this episode here. Please stay tuned for the next episode, episode 36, The Rebellions of 1837, Part 3, where we continue our look into the rebellions, but this time it'll be with Mackenzie and the Rebellion in Upper Canada. Now remember, at any time, feel free to leave comments or questions below, and I'll do my best to respond to them all. And please... Be a true Canadian and be polite. And if you like this content, give this video a thumbs up and click that subscribe button below to see more. And remember to also hit the bell if you'd like to be notified of any new content. Thanks everyone and have a great day. Oh!